Hello, everyone, and welcome for today's webinar uh, with the Happening Team. Today, we're going to discuss on how Happening Team build their profanity detection use case uh, using Quack and other solutions. Uh, I'm Pavel from the Quack team. With me today, Philip, who is leading the data science, Matea, who is the data science who worked on this use case, and Zvonimir, which is the machine learning engineer who takes this model to production. Um, during the, the webinar, feel free to ask any questions in the chat. We'll go over them at the last part of the webinar. So, without further ado, Philip, handing over to you to start and kick it off. Thank you, Paul, and thanks for hosting us. Uh, so, I am a data science manager at Happening. Happening is the technology and digital heartbeat behind Superbets International Brands. Uh, so, we are a technology company which is building systems required to have the betting business online and thriving. So, as the tech engine behind Superbet Global Platforms, you might have interacted with uh, our technology stack if you live in one of those countries. So, Superbet brand uh, exists in Romania, Serbia and Poland. Uh, Napoleon brand uh, exists in Belgium and Lucky7 Ventures exists in Sweden and they're all, all powered by Happening. Happening is a technology company, so uh, it all started with Romania. Now we scaled to across Europe, basically. It's uh, already, we have offices or so remote presence in 10 plus locations. There are more than 30 product teams. And last time someone counted, there were all, all, all over 550 people on board. And among those 550 people is the happening data science team of eight currently. Uh, we are responsible for an end-to-end -end model development, model deployment, and model serving in production. So to rise to that responsibility, but keep focus on the data science part of the job, we've adopted Quack back in 2021. Uh, we started with a POC, followed with a customer value model, and continued till today. Uh, where we are using two Quack environments with roughly 10 models in production. Uh, during that time, uh, Quack was really flexible and reliable platform, uh, which enabled us to deliver these models to production with efficiency. So the use case uh, we chose to present today, today among those is the profanity detector for Superbet. So let me introduce the use case. Um, one of our products developed a chat functionality which is a place for sports fans to chat about the match or a ticket. So users are passionate about sports and betting and discussions can get heated. You can see an example uh, of a mock on a, on a mobile app where a comment is hidden because it's flagged as inappropriate. So that's us. And product wanted to keep the ability for users to uh, reveal that comment. So there is an ability to reveal it if you want to, but for users who don't want to be uh, exposed to so much uh, hated speech, uh, we are blocking it in real time. And with that introduction, I give it to Matea, our data scientist, who is working on the model behind that. Um, yeah, so before the data science team got involved, the initial approach to that solution was uh, using a manually crafted the blacklist of words, so using a list of profanities that have to be blocked. And that was a static approach that uh, our customer support team developed. Uh, so uh, they had to add all the stems from profanities uh, to the list. Uh, and that was, a, uh, that was not the best solution because it was easy to bypass and customers were getting creative with trying to figure out a way to, uh, to cheat the system a little bit. And uh, one of the other problems was that some of the stems were really short and very common in different words. So uh, this, the solution produced a lot of false positives and it uh, flagged messages that were not necessarily profane. So it kind of felt that we were suffocating the chat. Uh, another thing is that at the time it was only uh, for Romania, which was fine for that, but uh, we knew that there was a, that the markets were expanding and we knew that we had to create some more space for the project to develop and uh, to be able to add more languages and markets to the mix uh, with minimal human interaction. 
Uh, so that's why we decided we decided to pivot to towards machine learning. Uh, so this is this is the kind of general architecture of the model that we used. Uh, so on the left side, you can see a bit or a large language model that was trained on uh, a huge data set. Uh, you can kind of compare it to training it on the entire Wikipedia for one language. Uh, so since they were trained on so much so much data, they kind of understand the language that they were trained on, or multiple languages if that's what uh, if that's what they were trained on. Uh, so we decided to combine those large language models and another classifier model with it uh, to use it to train on our customer support labeled data set. So it was kind of uh, adapted and fine tuned for our specific use case. So the end result of the model is a profanity score from zero to one. So it kind of lets us know how sure the model is that uh, a certain message uh, is profane. Uh, to accomplish all of this, this is, these are the technologies that we used. So we use Hugging Face to pull the pre-trained models, those large language models, as I've said before. Uh, for uh, Romania and Poland, we had specific models for that country. So we used those instances. Uh, since they are very, very expensive to train, it was easier to use the pre-trained ones. Uh, we used PyTorch to write the code that was the main framework used uh, and to train the models. Uh, weights and biases were kind of our biggest help for uh, registering the models and keeping track of all the experiments. Uh, so to log them, uh, to log the data sets and write up, write, write up reports. And then that was during the development phase. And then Quack came in for model deployment and serving as the last step in the, in the entire process. Um, after we develop it, so before it's put on Quack, uh, there are still some steps that we need to do from the development side. Uh, so after we decide on the best model from weights and biases, which is just stored as, uh, as weights of the model, uh, we have to start the handover between development and engineering. So we implement the interface for the Quack side so that the model is able to use those, uh, those weights and transfer it to Quack and predict what the message is going to be. Uh, we also have a test data set that we uh, that we uh, use to evaluate the model's performance and all the metrics so we can benchmark models, compare uh, between two versions of them, and see which one is better. And then lastly, but probably the most importantly, uh, we have a regression data set, uh, which is the main step of the testing, actually, uh, and that is to decide, so it's, in short, a list of profanities that must never pass. So uh, if that test fails, then we have to do it all over again and uh, think about more, more about the training. Um, and yeah, with that, uh, my job as a developer is uh, kind of over for that time, and I'm passing it over to our ML engineer, uh, Zlonimir, who's going to explain what happens on the clock side. Yeah, uh, thanks, Matteo. Uh, now we'll talk about the build and the deploy process. Uh, here you can see that the input for the clock build process are weights and bias artifact uh, that contains the best model and the model repo code. Uh, this uh, repository is installed as a pip dependency during the build process, and uh, we initialize uh, the model weights from that weights and bias artifact within that build process. And we also perform a regression and sanity check tests just to make sure that the numbers on the quack side are aligned with the numbers on the development side. And so the final output of this build process uh, is a Docker image that's easily deployable on the quack platform. And uh, so now that we've covered uh, basically how we work with the platform and what, what are the responsibilities between the data scientists and the ML engineers, uh, we'll talk about the recent developments uh, we've had on the project. So just to give a bit of a background, uh, we initially developed a profanity detection model for the Romanian market. And uh, quite soon after that, we had to do the same thing for the Serbian and the Polish market. And at that time, we decided that it's best for us to develop a separate model for each of those markets. And of course, quite recently, we got a request to do the same thing for the Belgian market, which is a multilingual country. 
And of course, it became obvious that having a separate model for each market or each language doesn't really scale well. So we introduced a, a shift in our development towards multi-language models and small specialized models for niche cases. Uh, this approach goes really well uh, with a feature from the Quack platform called the uh, Quack Audiences. Uh, it allows us to host uh, multiple models under the same endpoint uh, while uh, Quack manages the routing internally. And uh, this means if we try to migrate our setup uh, to the audience's setup, uh, we'd use the multi-language model as a fallback variation so that we could support newly coming markets. And if needed, we could deploy the language specific versions. And uh, we've done a, a successful proof of concept project. And uh, here you can see some simple screenshots from the platform. You see that we created an audience for the Romanian market, which uh, maps directly to the Romanian model. And we created a, an audience for the Polish market that maps directly to the Polish version of the model. And we use the multi-language model as the fallback version. And this is this all happens within a single Quack model on the platform. Okay. So when we discuss uh, what are the benefits of having develop this development shift, uh, one of the main ones is the ability to develop a multi-language model that covers ninety percent of the chat messages. And having these Quack audiences, uh, this allows us to easily deploy specific models within that same endpoint. End point. And this approach really gives the engineering team more flexibility without having to worry about breaking the interface with the client side. So right now, what we're currently missing uh, from the platform is having the native support for variation chaining, in other words, model ensembles, uh, which is part of our future work plans. Uh, so to explain it in a bit more detail, uh, we plan to use it. We plan to use the multi-language model as a default entry point for all the messages. Then we would write some custom rules and logic to pass those messages to specialized models so that they could provide some additional information. Because in some cases, we know that the multi-language model isn't as reliable as a specialized one. And the final profanity score would then be determined by both those models. And uh, of course, we're collaborating with the Quark team so that they could provide us with the features we need to do that. And of course, uh, we're planning to work on our uh, continuous training. And uh, to do that, we need to establish the feedback loop that will take the latest data from the production, retrain the model, deploy it, and this integrates nicely with Quark monitoring. And that's it from the production side. And that's all we have planned. It's short to the point and sweet, so we are open for questions. Yeah, guys, so if you have questions, feel free to write them right now in the Q&A section. Just as a fun fact, uh, we didn't uh, use PyTorch initially. We were using TensorFlow, but yeah. <laughs> And yeah, after we shifted to TensorFlow, all of our mod models got so much quicker. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, the Pythons. And there's much more support from the research community yeah. there. Yeah. So maybe we should have put some TensorFlow logo like small <laughs> in the upper <laughs> corner. Um, how did you do the fine tuning? Uh, I mean, we did the full fine tuning, so. Uh, we didn't just tune the classifier head, we tuned the entire model. We tried the both options and results were much better when we uh, we tuned the entire model. We did it in just a couple of epochs because that's what's the best for, for tuning such large language models. Uh, but yes, so like full full propagation of everything. Maybe another angle to it is uh, that uh, our languages weren't like English, German, French. So we started with Romanian, then Serbian. And uh, so the support in large language models was yeah. really limited. And we ended up training way more than uh, what we would have done with one of the major mm -hmm. languages. Then there's also a specific case here, which uh, like models understand Wikipedia corpuses of text, which is kind of uh, 
large sentences and stuff like that. But chat, especially sports chat conversations, are sometimes very short, so even shorter than SMS messages you would type to a friend. And uh, it's often, yeah, not really a language, specific language. So we had to adjust for that as well, uh, which meant uh, sampling a lot of chat discussions and labeling them. And this also proved to be a major part of the work. Can't really just rely on downloading the model and making it work in such a specific case. And that's also one of the reasons why we started with independent models, because there is no model covering those languages out of the box. So we yet need to find a way. Uh, we have a working prototype, but uh, which would be good enough to be a multi-language for this particular combination of languages. Yeah. Cool. Okay, we have uh, some other questions, so let's uh, address those. Did you use any parameter optimization like LoRa, um, and why or why not? Uh, no, no, we didn't. Um, it just. Uh... It just didn't fit in with our experiments. Yeah. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank about. you about that. Did you carry out any form of topic modeling? Uh, we tried with topic modeling at the very beginning of it, but it didn't prove to be very useful because, as Philip said, it was just a lot of, a lot of everything in the chat, and also something that we deal with is a lot of spam in the messages. So that also kind of suffocated the quality data that we could get out of it. There is also the specifics of not suffocating the chat. Mm -hmm. There is something that you would normally block in a kind of a um, forum or a group conversation. Here it's okay, uh, because if there's a goal or a penalty, some sides who are cheering for team A or team B are kind of against it, some are pro it, and then you can't, we, we, it's not our use case that we block like repetitive messages from different users. So it's an expression of emotion, so that's okay. There's also some level of betting lingo or sports lingo. We are not really a library, it's more of a pub online, so you're allowed to be profane in some emotional. instance, emotional, yeah. And uh, that all made it a bit more difficult and uh, the more the reason to introduce context to it because we now have a score. It's no longer just a stem because if you write a long sentence which includes a bit of uh, kind of words which you would usually flag in a dictionary as offensive, it's not that offensive as if you would just write it uh, three times in a row or once, etc. So this was another case to move against, move away from the dictionary approach. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a specific case. Chat is not normal discussion. Okay, cool. Um, great. Another question. You mentioned having default and backup models. Is there some kind of a logical flow to decide which one to use? I guess it's regarding the audiences. Yeah, we can cover the current implementation and the future one to be. So yeah, yeah in the current implementation, uh, the client side just needs to specify in the headers uh, which market they want to target. But for the future work, uh, we haven't decided on the rules uh, when to pass the message to the specialized models. They'll definitely hit the multi-language model first. And uh, I don't know, we haven't really designed the... Uh... So to give a bit of more context, uh, we have uh, like geolocation of users or even native apps uh, installed in different uh, locations which you can't install unless you're in that location. So by this client driven, uh, clients know in which area market they are and they uh, invoke the or the backend invokes the endpoint with the designation of that market. And currently the only way is that it goes directly to the market specific model, which has to have all the logic built in. So if we have a Romanian specific model, it goes just there. Going forward, I believe, uh, or we want to consider something is building a more generic multi-language model, which would give its first evaluation. It will always go there. And it will give a certain like assessment and give a score of how certain it is in the message classification. And then if we have a specialized version, we would not build the full language model, model there, but rather we would be like data driven and if there's something failing in the multi-language, we will cover that in the specialized model if it's really language specific. 
So this could be another language model. This could be also some uh, rules if need be, if we can't find anything for that language and it's failing constantly and we want just to ensure that it doesn't pass. Mm -hmm. uh, because some things uh, in one language, when you come to a multi-language scenario, if something is okay word in one language, in another one is not. Mm -hmm. So we need to cover that then by being specific. Good. Uh, another question is, what did you use as a training data set? Is it the real comments or something else? Yeah, we used real comments from from our social chat when we were developing uh, Romania. We already had uh, like a reporting system for our customer support, so we were able to get a lot of comments that were already processed manually because users are reporting each other. So yeah, we we had a lot of data to work for to work with uh, at that point. Uh, when it came to Serbia, we were going off of day zero, so we didn't have a lot of data for that, but uh, we managed to, uh, with some help from our customer support, we managed to get a, a data set that was enough for, for a working solution. So, yeah, uh, it was it was comments from our super social page, yeah. Got it, thank you. And last question for now is, Someone says he has troubles managing experiments, keeping track. How is your team doing that with Quark model registry and you know weights and biases? How do you combine both of those? Well, uh, for the model registry, we're currently using weights and biases, mm -hmm. and uh, we mainly use the platform for uh, the deployment side. So maybe a specific in this particular use case which yeah. we are discussing is that uh, we don't train the final model in Quark. Mm -hmm. We train it outside of Quark, but we store all the weights and all the information needed to initialize the model in weights and bias. Mm -hmm. And then we developed a custom interface and a process which would once deployed to Quark via Git, once the like commit is pull requested into a master, it should kick off a process which would trigger a build, which would take the latest weights from Quark for that particular project and then build the model. And hence we have all those regression tests and sanity checks because um, there was an instance where due to I don't know, some random seeds or some initialization which didn't uh, mm -hmm. wasn't the same uh, on local development and remote ended up with slightly different scores once initialized in Quark. So it could be I don't know, instead of zero point 915, it would be 0 0.918 or 900. So we designed a regression test set, uh, which we upload, and then Quack Build has to check against that just to prevent. It's not the actual like full-fledged test, but it's enough to keep the these inconsistencies from happening. Yeah. And actually, once we fixed all those initializations, it never happened again. So it's okay. Yeah. And the interface we we only did it once. We did have to fix some bugs with it, but after after we made the interface between weights and biases and Quack, we use, use the uh, both Quack and weights and biases tagging system, so we can label all the versions and keep track of those. And then we just uh, we just tell Quack which which version from weights and biases to use. Yeah, and and using those regression tests, it gives you more confidence that the new build, the new version won't break anything in production, right? That's right. I mean, we don't have automated deploy, yeah. but it's a step towards that. If it fails, it can't go further. If it pro if it builds successfully and all tests pass, which is when the build is successful, then we can manually deploy, which is uh, just a click, like deploy, exchange, and quack handles the rest. So that's really a nice feature. Perfect. Okay, so I think as we don't have any more questions left for today, we answered everything. Um, I think we can wrap it up officially now. So again, thank you all for joining for this session. Hope you enjoyed that and have a good day and a nice week. Yeah, thank you for participating in the questions. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye.